a generation of Americans are facing the prospect of making a hell of a lot less money in real dollar terms than their parents. There are wages that are certainly higher than a guaranteed minimal standard. And there are wages that can be lower than a guaranteed minimal standard. That was Senator Bob Casey and Representative John Joyce, both from Pennsylvania, talking about the pros and cons of raising the federal minimum wage. Welcome to our In Focus discussion tonight on raising the minimum wage. Earlier this month, the U.S. Congress passed a COVID relief bill aimed at getting money to those affected by the pandemic. One part of the bill was to increase the federal minimum wage, which is currently at $7.25 per hour. But ultimately, this part of the package was eliminated. We start our conversation tonight with a discussion on why we have a minimum wage. Joining us now live in studio to talk about the history of the minimum wage is Thomas Maloney, professor of economics at the University of Utah. Professor, thanks for being with us tonight and welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Professor, could you take us back to the creation of the minimum wage? When was it first enacted and why? So the minimum wage is enacted as part of the what's called the Fair Labor Standards Act in 1938. This was a law that did a number of things. Um, it enacted the minimum wage. It set the 40-hour workweek standard. Uh, it required overtime pay. It dealt with child labor. So it was a large kind of restructuring and addressing of, of ills in the labor market. Now, today, a person making the federal minimum wage working 40 hours per week will make a little bit more than $15,000 per year. How does that compare to the last time that the minimum wage was raised? Well, so under the, as you said, under the current minimum wage, um, somebody working full time at that wage would make about 15,000. But this is um, a reduction in the purchasing power of the minimum wage uh, relative to prior times. When we raise the wage, we set it at a nominal dollar value and then inflation eats it away. Um, the maximum purchasing power of the dollar, uh, of the minimum wage um, in, in sort of real dollar terms was actually 1968. The nominal minimum, minimum wage then was $1.60 but that would buy you more than $10 worth of goods now. So we're well below the purchasing power value that we've had in the past. Now, there are cases to be made both for and against minimum wages. How do economists research this issue? You're right, there are uh, cases to be made both ways. They're the simplest models would tell us that if you raise the price of labor, you will have uh, disemployment effects, people will lose their jobs. Other also very similar models tell us that if the market is not perfectly competitive, then you can raise the minimum wage without causing people to lose their jobs. Um, so there are arguments on both sides theoretically. Uh, empirically, it's hard to study. You know, what you'd want to do is raise the minimum wage and just have nothing else change, sort of a controlled experiment. That never happens. So um, we have various statistical methods to, to try to control for other things that might be affecting employment, because that's the main sort of negative side concern that you might have disemployment effects. Now, several states and counties have increased their minimum wage laws to exceed the federal standard. What have we seen in those areas with the wage increases? Yeah, you're right. There's been a real proliferation of those kinds of policies, and that's created new opportunities to, to study the policy because you can think about a labor market maybe that straddles a state line where you have a higher minimum on one side and a lower minimum on the other, and that gives you a better chance at studying the effects. Uh, where we've been able to do that, what we generally find is that there are very small, probably statistically very near zero, uh, disemployment effects. Um, in the Seattle case, which has been um, pretty well studied, there's debate about what, it, uh, what we actually see there. But what we appear to see is the minimum wage, the increase in the minimum wage there has raised the wages of people who are already in jobs near that wage. They've been able to keep their jobs. Um, there's debate about whether it slowed new hiring, but um, in general, the effects in terms of effects on employment uh, are not found to be large, and they, it does improve the wages of people at the bottom. Now, Professor, if I may, where do you stand on raising the minimum wage, and what would you like to leave our viewers with on this topic? Well, I, I think that we have room, certainly, to raise the minimum wage right now. I think that um, uh, we could do so probably substantially without uh, having any disemployment effects. I think it would be the right thing to do for people who are less well off. It's had good effects in terms of reducing racial inequality. Um, it has other kinds of inequality impacts. So I think that we could do it. I think we also might want to consider indexing it to inflation or indexing it as a proportion of the average wage 
so that we don't have to go through these kinds of debates uh, due to the effects of inflation um, as we currently have to do every once in a while. All right, you've been hearing from Thomas Maloney, professor of economics at the University of Utah. Professor, thank you so much for joining us tonight and being a part of our conversation. Thank you. I think it's the wrong time. It's a 12% increase, which is pretty big. Um, they didn't give us enough time to get ready for it. That was Thomas Ward, a restaurant owner in Florida, talking about how raising the minimum wage is going to hurt his business, especially during the pandemic. Florida passed a $15 an hour minimum wage last November. Thanks for staying with us for our second In Focus discussion tonight on raising the minimum wage. Joining us now live via Zoom is Connor Boyack, president of the Libertas Institute, which is opposed to raising the minimum wage. Connor, great to have you back on the show. Thanks for being with us tonight. Thanks for having me. Connor, let's start with an overview of your opposition to the minimum wage increase. Now, are you opposed to an increase or the minimum wage in general? Uh, great question to start off the conversation. I, th I think the answer is yes. Uh, the problem here is that this is all entirely arbitrary. Uh, why $15? Why not 14? Why not 16? Why not 25? If this is about helping uh, low income people and, and magically solving those problems, why stop at 15? Uh, these are arbitrary decisions. They're not based on any empirical math or principled position. Uh, really, this is an issue for the market to handle. And if people can't provide $15 in value to their employer, if they're required to pay them 15, then they're gonna lose their job and that's just really unfortunate. So we oppose this issue in general. Definitely an interesting way to think about it. Now, raising the minimum wage is extremely popular across the country. Why do you think that is? What problem is it trying to solve? It's, it's, it's a sexy issue, right? It's very easy to say, well, yeah, we want people to be paid more. They deserve to be paid more. It's an issue that gets people emotionally riled up. Uh, but they don't often understand the broader picture. And the reality that this is kind of a fake issue. Only 3% of workers currently earn at or below the minimum wage, and half of them are under 25. Interestingly, that's down from 13% in 1979. So the problem has been resolving itself. This is not a problem that re uh, requires more government. And it's really just the, the young people and inexperienced people and very few, only 3% of the whole workforce that's being paid hourly. So this just really isn't the big issue that a lot of people portray it to be. What an interesting statistic. I'm not sure many people know that. Now, if businesses were allowed to create their own wages with no regulation of a minimum wage, what do you think would prevent worker exploitation? Hmm. Well, Think of that 3%. The opposite is 97%. 97% of workers in America that are paid hourly are being paid over the minimum wage. There's no exploitation. So it stands to reason that if the minimum wage went away, nothing much would change. It's not like half of the workforce is being paid that minimum. This is only a small number of people. There's no exploitation in an economic relationship where consent is involved. In other words, if I go get a job, my employer willingly pays me for terms that we mutually agree to. There's no exploitation there. I can choose to get another job. I can leave elsewhere. I can find other opportunities. So we would really uh, reject this idea that there's any exploitation in this mutually consenting kind of employer relationship. But in reality, 97% of people are already earning more. So we just don't see that as a, a real concern to be had if the minimum wage were to be repealed. In your mind, what are the obligations of businesses to pay for the value of the labor that they utilize in order to make a profit? Okay, so interesting question. I'm an employer. Uh, we employ about 25 people. Uh, so what are my obligations as an employer? Well, it's whatever we've agreed to. Uh, we negotiate when I hire each of them. We come up with a, a price that they feel fairly compensates their value. As their value increases, as they gain more skill, I have to pay them more. Otherwise, I might lose them. They might be hired off by a competitor. Um, and frankly, if they're not pulling their weight, if they're not bringing in enough value to our organization that justifies that compensation, then maybe they're going to lose their job. And so what are the obligations as an employer? I think it's really whatever that contract is between you and your employee. Uh, beyond that, there's really no role for the government to be involved. It's an agreement between two parties and should probably be respected as such. Now, Connor, won't an increase in wages pump more money into the economy in general, thus generally helping businesses out? 
I think this was a point that the uh, economist on the previous segment made, which I find funny. You, you ask a, a lawyer's opinion about the law, you're going to get all kinds of opinions. Economists widely uh, disagree on this issue. Uh, in fact, the Congressional Budget Office reviewed this exact issue. They estimated that 1.3 million Americans could lose their jobs if we increase the minimum wage to $15, and that that increase would reduce business income and raise prices because companies, what are they going to do? They're going to pass on the higher costs of labor to uh, the end consumer. It's not like there's magic money on a tree that we can you know, spontaneously provide to people to pay them more money. This is a real issue that's gonna impact especially the small businesses. And uh, so no new money is being pumped in the economy. It's a business owner who was gonna invest in their business, you know, create a second shop or whatever. Now they gotta put more money into labor um, and, and you know that money would have already gone into the economy in some other fashion. It's just the government now telling them they have to put it into the economy in a certain fashion that maybe harms their business. Connor, about 30 seconds left. I'd like to get final thoughts from you. Anything else you'd like to mention that we haven't addressed yet? It's easy to think about this issue in terms of like Amazon and Jeff Bezos, and they have all the money in the world, so they need to give more to their employees. But jurisdictions across the country have been experimenting with this, as was said in the previous segment. And, it, and, and it's not a statistically zero issue like The Economist said. Small businesses have had to shut down. Employers have had to let people go. There have been real problems in those jurisdictions. And so it's the small businesses that are going to be impacted the most. And it's for them that we stand up and say the government should not be raising the minimum wage. It's going to harm a lot of businesses along the way. All right. You've been hearing from Connor Boyack, president of Libertas Institute. Connor, always great to have you join us. Thank you again. Thanks for having me. $7.25 an hour is a starvation wage. That's what it is. That was Senator Bernie Sanders last month making the case for raising the minimum wage nationally. Welcome to our third and final in focus discussion tonight on raising the minimum wage. While the national minimum wage still sits at $7.25 an hour, 29 states pass laws that make the minimum wage higher than that, and eight states plus Washington, D.C. pass laws to raise the rate to $15 an hour. Joining us now live in studio is Representative Claire Collard, one of two Utah legislators who ran bills last session that aimed to raise the minimum wage. Representative Collard, thanks for being here and welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Representative, why do you feel it's important to raise the minimum wage? Well, first of all, it's really important that people are able to earn a living wage and to support themselves and to be self-sufficient. And $7.25 an hour just does not allow that to happen. The minimum wage was last raised in 2009. Uh, as you know, the, the cost of living in the state of Utah has increased dramatically since that time. And currently, in order to afford a two-bedroom apartment, you need to make about $19.83 an hour to afford that apartment. Now, your bill was to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour by 2025 across the entire state. Why do you feel that the wage should be increased at the same rate all across Utah? Okay. Well, you know, it's really an interesting concept. I know my colleague, uh, Representative Matthews, had a bill that was actually uh, tiered for rural Utah and as opposed to uh, more urban counties along the Wasatch Front. But the fact remains that if you are living on $1,256 a month, you are not able to support yourself. You're relying on public assistance, on food stamps, and we know that you know, people, there's dignity in work and people need to be able to support themselves. So it just makes sense to raise the, the minimum wage to $15 across the board. And that's really a reality that a lot of Utah families are facing. Now, based off your last question, Representative, obviously there's a lot of nuances in this issue, like should we raise it, yes, no, if so, where, when, how, right? Why is there so much conversation to be had surrounding minimum wage? There's, there's lots of different takes on this. Uh, the bottom line is that people need to be able to support themselves. Uh, there's. We know that there is an influx of capital that goes back in to the economy when people make more. Uh, these people that are making minimum wage, there's about almost 29,000 people in the state of Utah who are currently making minimum wage. 
about 25% of those are people in the age group of 16 to 19 years old. But that means that 75% are actually over 20. Many of them are working full time. In fact, the statistics we have show that at least 55% of those workers are working full time. And it's just something that needs to be done. Uh, we know that this is, this is a critical issue and to many people who are working two and three jobs, the outcomes are just not great. Uh, I have people in my district who are working two jobs. They have children who are in high school who are dropping out of high school because they have to work a full-time job and the load is just too much. Right. Uh, do you think that the government should be the one setting the minimum wage because out of all the capitalistic arguments, what people should make seems to be a core value of what a business should be able to determine. I do believe that the minimum wage needs to be uh, mandated at, at, the, at a government level. Uh, we have, we've legislated things like, you know, child labor laws and uh, being paid overtime when you work more than 40 hours a week. Uh, minimum wage seems to just fit in that, that same category. We need to be able to uh, address these people that are not making enough to survive. Uh, it really is a fiscal issue as well, because if we can reduce the reliance on uh, public assistance, then we can translate that money into uh, paying those, those wages. We know that economies do flourish when people are making more money. They spend the money in the economy. They're not saving this money. They're paying rent. They're buying groceries. They're supporting their families. So it really does need to be a legislative issue. Would you say that the goal of raising the minimum wage is to bring people out of poverty? And if so, is this an effective way of doing that? Oh, absolutely. Uh, we know that by raising the minimum wage, my bill uh, would have raised the minimum wage to $12 an hour, and then incrementally over the next five years would have taken it to 15. We know that people would have been brought out of poverty by doing that. Thousands of families would benefit from it. Now, why wouldn't businesses cut jobs or raise prices in order to balance out lost profit if wages were increased? Mm -hmm. There's lots of studies have been done on that. Um, it's, it's really a matter of, of going back to the more money being put into the economy. And, um, you know, there's, there's studies done that show that if there were an increase in cost, perhaps your hamburger would cost 30 cents more. So it's, it's really a negligible cost. And when you look at the benefit of having people be able to be self-sufficient and support themselves and not reliant on social programs, it, it really is a win-win. Representative, we have about 30 seconds left. I'd like to get final thoughts from you. What would you like to leave our viewers with tonight? Sure. Uh, I, I would like to add that I've been talking to a lot of small business owners who at first were uh, very concerned about this, this uh, the opportunity to raise the minimum wage. But we realize that uh, many of these employers are having to pay 12, 14, and close to $15 an hour just to hire employees. This raise of minimum wage would really address the issues that are impacting about 30,000 people within our state and bring thousands of, of families out of poverty. Uh, I would urge people to support this the, uh, the fact that people have to live on $1,256 a month is just not cutting it. Thank no. you. Thank you. You've been hearing from Representative Claire Collard of Magna. Thank you for joining our conversation tonight. We really appreciate your time.